corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. Okay, I already see one. Give me. Okay. They're the same picture. In Terraria, all furniture items are stored on spreadsheets. Some spreadsheets are simple, only containing one furniture item, while others are much more complex, storing multiple different items on the same sheet. When the game is presented with one of these more complex spreadsheets, it looks at one of two internal values to know what to do. The first of these is frame X, the horizontal position in a given spreadsheet, while the second is frame Y, the vertical position in a given spreadsheet. Both of these are measured in pixels. For example, with grandfather clocks, the game references only frame X when trying to determine which item to return when the tile is broken. On the flip side, torches reference only frame Y, though there are a select few tiles which reference both. The bast is a bit different. It is one item but with two different states, on and off, stored 72 pixels apart on the sprite sheet. In order to change the bast statue from on to off, the game increases the frame X value of all the tiles in this 2x3 area by 72. And to turn it off, it does the opposite. It decreases the frame X value of all tiles in this area by 72. But what would happen if we put something in this area that wasn't a bass statue, like a door? Well, then the game would change the door's frame X value by 72. And then it would change its frame X value by 72 again. And again. And again and again. This method of arbitrarily increasing frame X is called Philosopher's Stone, and it's how we can obtain any item in the game with just one statue. In Terraria, the door sprite sheet is pretty large, clocking in at 1982 pixels tall and 142 pixels wide. In order to keep track of everything, the game looks at both frame X and frame Y, making doors one of a select few tile sets which are sensitive to changes in both values. And within all of this complexity, there is one coding oversight that helps make transmutation as powerful as it is. When a door is broken, the game does not check to make sure its frame X, Y values are within the expected range, and instead, it will use whatever value you give it. For example, the frame X value of a steampunk door which has been turned into Zenith is 8604, while its original frame X value is only 36. And the game doesn't question this frame X value at all. For the rest of the video, this graphic will help visualize how transmutation works. Items arranged in a column are separated by single IDs, so a lead bar to a tungsten bar to a platinum bar are all steps of one. Items in the same row are separated by intervals of 36, so from a lead bar to a topaz staff to a cobalt pickaxe is ID steps of 36. Why 36? This is because once you go off the right side of the sprite sheet, the game defaults to a bit of code that looks like this, but the gist of it is, every time frame X increases by 72, the ID of the item returned increases by 36, and the inverse is true as well. If frame X would decrease by 72, the ID would decrease by 36. So if we use Philosopher's Stone once on an obsidian door, we obtain a lead bar. And then if we use Philosopher's Stone once again, we go up 36 IDs and obtain the Topaz Staff. Using Philosopher's Stone again gives us a Cobalt Pickaxe, and we can continue on and on to obtain whatever item we want in that given row. But what if we want an item that isn't in that row? Well, then we need to move down a column, and that's where the campfire glitch comes into play. The campfire glitch allows us to move up and down in a given column by single IDs. That's the other thing that this bit of code does. The campfire glitch allows us to change frame Y by 54 pixels, and in the context of this code, every time frame Y increases by 54 pixels, the ID of the item returned increases by 1. And the opposite is true, just like with Philo. With these two methods together, we can use Philosopher's Stone to move very quickly through the list of IDs by manipulating our frame X value, and then we can use the campfire glitch to fine-tune where we are by manipulating our frame Y value. In effect, you can use any door to reach any item which is obtainable with Philosopher's Stone.
All you need to do is go across and then up or down using CGO. But how do we know which direction to go? How would you, say, turn a wooden door into Zenith? Since it's not possible to view frame x, y values in game, we instead use a spreadsheet that functions as a map for where we are in a given transmutation. For example, if we were transmuting from a wooden door and we wanted to obtain Terragrim, we can tell that, from the spreadsheet, we would need to turn the wooden door into a meteor toilet using Philo, and then we would step forward using CGO until we reach Terragrim. And if we demo this in-game, we'll be going over the spreadsheet in more detail after discussing the setups for transmutation, and some advanced techniques, which I reckon is why you're here. And so, without further ado. The first step to setting up the Philosopher's Stone glitch is to make sure you're in multiplayer. Using Host in Play through Steam works just fine for this. Here is a list of items needed for setting up the glitch. This updated transmutation setup was discovered by SMW underscore JV05, whose methods I then adapted slightly to reduce their material costs. To start with, build a small platform three blocks up off the ground. Then, remove these two tiles on either side, and you can also clean up the tiles used to pillar up, too. Next, you'll want to stack up with a few blocks on the left side, and then you'll need to assemble this shape here. This gives us space to place two bass statues. Now, we're going to perform a few glitches. Start by placing a trapdoor here, a bass statue here, and, using block swap, replace this piece of wood with a piece of sand. Place your remaining four pieces of sand, like so. Now, break the bottom part of the bass statue. And you should notice that the sand will begin to float. At least, in your universe. Yep. We need to talk about parallel universes. Currently, we see no trapdoor and the sand is floating. You can think of this as what we see in our parallel universe. However, according to the server, there's still a trap door there. Or this is what's happening in the server's parallel universe. The next step is to place the bass statue down here, and then to place a torch on this tile. This is to cause the trap door that the server sees to update and break. If all goes well, you should get your trap door back. As a result of the desync, while the bass statue has vanished on our screen, it's still there, according to the server. The last step is to place down a tile of sandstone right here. And you should get your bass statue back. This is because we've created our first of two floating bass heads. Hey there, Editing Ethereal here. As a quick note, between the time when you place the torch and the time when you place the sandstone, you have to be very fast in a regular world. This is because any block update anywhere else in the world will cause the game to realize something is going on, and for the bass statue to break. As of recording, being as fast as possible is the best workaround, but hopefully a method that's 100% reliable is discovered soon. It'd be a shame if transmutation's weakness were to be the way the game spawns ferns. Alright, back to the video. Then remove the sandstone, followed by the sand, in that order. Removing the sand first can cause the bass statue to break. All that's left is to clean up and to repeat the same steps on the other side. Clean up the floor, place down the trapdoor, place down the bast, place down the sand, rake the bast, inducing the desync, place the bast on the sand, place your torch to rake the trapdoor, and once more the bast has desynced and become invisible to us. And lastly, place down the sandstone. The final step, like last time, is to break the sandstone then the sand. Now then, while we can't see them, we've successfully created two floating bast heads. In order to cause the server to resynchronize and to make the basts visible again, all you need to do is save and quit, and join the world again. As a note, make sure to wait for 15 seconds when backing out of the multiplayer game before loading into either single player or multiplayer again. This is to ensure that the map has sufficient time to save, as otherwise your progress might get rolled back. After waiting 15 seconds and coming back, we can see 
that we now have two floating bass heads. All that's left is to place the wire going through the bass statues. And a method of activating it, like a pressure plate. Alternatively, you can build the setup over a naturally generated dough trap to do transmutation without the mechanic. For example, this is what the setup would look like using naturally generated wire. Now, all that needs to be done is execution of the glitch. And there's one. And there's two. Much like with the previous instance, if we wait 15 seconds and relog, we'll find two floating bast heads. And if you're looking for a way to activate them, the pressure plate that comes with a naturally generated dough trap has you covered. Just don't forget to break the trap itself. Using Philosopher's Stone or Philo by itself, we're able to transmute any item in a given row. The obsidian door gives us a lead bar, the topaz staff, a cobalt pickaxe, the cactus workbench, etc. However, to obtain items from other rows, we need to start from that corresponding row's door, unless we use the campfire glitch. Just like how Philosopher's Stone allows us to move left and right in a given row, the campfire glitch allows us to move up and down in a given column. So, if we were at the mithril pickaxe, we could use the campfire glitch to turn that to an adamantite pickaxe by moving down a row or vice versa to turn an adamantite pickaxe into a mithril pickaxe. In short, Philo for coarse ID adjustments, and CGO for fine ID adjustments. This is why we have two bass statues, so we can use one for Philo, and one to set up the campfire glitch, which we'll be going over right now. First, raise the floor slightly, toggle off the bass statues, place a campfire here, and then turn the bass statues back on. And you should notice that the top two tiles of the campfire disappear, with this one displaying as a campfire and this one displaying as a music box. By using Philosopher's Stone in this way, we've tricked the game into thinking that this campfire exists over here, and so it'll treat these tiles as if they are a campfire. And for clarity, I will highlight these tiles in green. The top left tile in particular has very special properties. We'll call that one our fuel tile. Using the campfire glitch is straightforward. All you need to do is place items in the green area and click on the top right corner of the campfire. The sprites of whatever is in the green area should change. However, to effectively use the campfire glitch, we need to understand the concept of fuel. Whenever you click on a campfire, the game looks at the top left tile and checks its frame Y value. If the frame Y value is greater than or equal to 36, it removes 36 from frame Y. But if the frame Y value is less than 36, it adds 36 to frame Y. The addition or subtraction of frame Y occurs in the entire 3x2 area, and this is why the campfire glitch is so useful. Because we can put things in that area that aren't campfires, and we can adjust their frame Y value up or down as we wish. Let's have a look at the techniques required to move up and down a given column. In general, it is much faster to move down a column than it is to move up a column. And no, these arrows aren't reversed. In Terraria's sprite sheet terms, this is down and this is up. The technique for going down a column is fairly straightforward. All you need to do is place something with a large frame Y value, like say a sandstone lamp, in the area of the fuel tile and then click on the top right corner of the campfire. Every time the campfire activates, the game changes the frame Y value of everything in the green area by 36 pixels. And the game will keep doing this as long as the sandstone lamp has a frame Y value greater than 36 pixels. In effect, the campfire burns a little of our frame Y value every time we activate it, hence the term fuel. Lamps, particularly sandstone lamps, are commonly used as fuel because they are easy to obtain and they have very large frame Y values, which, in effect, makes them perfect fuel. Furthermore, lamps are also infinitely recyclable. So, for example, when this sandstone lamp has run out of fuel, all you need to do to recover the lamp is break the tile under it. And, since I've gotten the lamp back, I can just place it again, and continue using CGO.
Now then, if you want to move up the spreadsheet, that's a bit more difficult since the lowest frame Y value of any tile is zero. So if we place a torch in our fuel tile with a frame Y value of zero, and we click our campfire, we successfully move up the sprite sheet. However, something interesting happens if we click the campfire again. We go back to where we started. This is as a consequence of these two conditions from before. Specifically, at first we have a frame Y value that is less than 36, so the game adds 36 pixels to frame Y. However, now we lie under the first condition. So when we go to activate the campfire again, the game instead removes 36 pixels from frame Y, and we're back where we started. Going down a column doesn't suffer from this flipping of conditions because there are many items, like lamps, which have huge frame Y values. For example, you can use CGO on a sandstone lamp 57 times before it flips to condition B. This is why it is fast and generally preferred to go down a column, as opposed to slowly moving up a column as you have to replace your fuel with every single step. Let's look at a practical example. Once again, I've pulled up the spreadsheet by Icy Snowman, and let's say we're trying to obtain a Rod of Harmony. We have a few different options. First, we could go from a wooden door to the Rubble Maker Medium, and then from the Rubble Maker, we could step forward using CGO to obtain the Rod of Harmony. However, there was a much faster and less labor-intensive way. Instead, we could use Philo and overshoot the Rubble Maker by one, go to a cursed blue brick wall, and then, if we step backwards with CGO, we loop around to the previous column, which allows us to reach the Rod of Harmony by moving backwards. And even though there's a greater distance in terms of IDs, this takes less time because of how blazing fast it is to move backwards with CGO. And these are the sort of transmutations used in speedruns. Well, there's one small twist. Up until now, we've only been using the campfire glitch in single player. However, as soon as we bring the campfire glitch into multiplayer, things change just a little bit. There's two things I'm going to be covering here, MCGO and the automatic transmutation setup. While not strictly related, these two things are very useful when combined together. Automatic transmutation is best illustrated through an example. Let's say we want to obtain Zenith, item ID 4956. Checking our spreadsheet, we can see that it'll take us 120 steps to get there. Which, using a setup such as this, will take a lot of clicking. Doing this 120 times takes about 3 minutes and will probably make your wrist hurt. Thankfully, there's a better way. This is where the automatic transmutation setup comes into play. In this chest is everything you need to set up automatic transmutation. Three blocks, two platforms, two pressure plates which are activated by the player, a handful of wire, and a way to place it. As a step zero, first make sure that the platform to the right of your bass statue is made out of solid blocks. Then, place a block here. Then, place a block here and another block here. There should be a two block gap between the blocks. Next, using your hammer, hammer the blocks into hoiks like so. Now, we're going to use our platforms to create platform hoiks by block swapping over the hoit blocks. Now, by holding W and S on top of this block, we begin to rapidly oscillate between them. Then, all we need to do is place a pressure plate here, and another one there. The last step is to add the wire. The pressure plate on the back needs to connect to the bass statues, and this front pressure plate here should be wired up like so. If performed correctly, when you place a door, jump on the pressure plates, start with the bass statues on, and hold W, then press S. We will begin to rapidly shift through our item transmutations. In just a matter of seconds, we 
have obtained a shell phone. While this setup is already a massive improvement, we can make it even better. That's the reason why we have the second bath statue. This will allow us to mix the campfire glitch and Philosopher's Stone. To set up the campfire glitch, toggle the bath statues off, place down your campfire, then toggle them on again. You'll notice that the top part of the campfire will disappear. Before we go on, there is one very important thing you'll want to do. Take a door, place it here, open it, place any block right here, and then right click the campfire. You'll notice that the door will begin to look strange. Now, all you need to do is break this block. You should notice that a ton of tiles will just get magically deleted in this area. And our bath statue seems to have disappeared, except it's gotten reduced to two pixels. This has made our bath statue a lot easier to work with. Under normal circumstances, it would be impossible to interact with these tiles here without breaking the bath statue. This is what is called the stabilized bath statue because it is less sensitive to block updates. Using this setup, it is now possible to obtain any item in the game. Using the bath statue to jump 36 IDs at a time and the campfire glitch to jump one ID at a time, starting at ID 649. But we can still make this setup even better. Let's talk about MCGO, or the multiplayer campfire glitch. MCGO is probably one of the single most powerful and strangest things to come out of transmutation. And to perform it, all you need to do is be in multiplayer when performing the campfire glitch. Talking about MCGO requires talking about parallel universes again. Because what MCGO does is it takes whatever is in the server's parallel universe and moves it to your parallel universe. The campfire itself lives in between parallel universes, which has all sorts of strange side effects. However, the main consequence of this is anything you use MCGO on ceases to exist for the server, meaning that once you disconnect, it'll no longer be a part of your world. However, this trade-off is worthwhile because of what MCGO can do. Let's revisit this graphic here. When transmuting from a given door, we have to pick an item to turn that door into, and we can only get one of that given item. MCGO allows us to bypass both of these restrictions. First, turn the door into your desired item. Here, I've turned our door into a cobalt pickaxe. Next, if we use MCGO without fuel, I can create a lot of pickaxes. And this works with any item you can transmute. Using this technique, we can infinitely duplicate our desired item and the item below it. However, we become unable to step to the left and right with Philosopher's Stone, because Philosopher's Stone requires our door to be in the server's parallel universe, while using MCGO makes it so the door now lives exclusively in our parallel universe. However, working around this restriction is actually fairly easy. Let's go back to our example with Zenith. Now we're back at the Antlion Lava Band. So, if we give our MCGO fuel and start pressing right click, we'll begin receiving items and lamps. And we can continue doing this until we reach our desired item. There's Zenith. There's the Celestial Starboard, some Universal Pylons, Boss Relics, and it looks like we've run out of fuel, but not before generating a whole bunch of items. MCGO is so powerful that inventory management becomes a problem because of how many items you're generating. So you'll either need to delete the items you don't need or keep a lot of chests nearby. Because we're working in between parallel universes, it's possible for your parallel universe to get stuck in a state where Philosopher's Stone won't work. If this happens, the easiest way to synchronize it to a valid state again is to break this block, this block, and then to fill in this entire space with tiles. Lastly, clear out space for the door once again. 
This should partially resynchronize us to the server's parallel universe, which is what we want. In effect, what MCGO does is we have our starting item, the Entline Lover Banner, and then every single item we get as we go backwards, looping around the sheet, drops. So we get a Spore Bat Banner, a Skeleton Banner, so on and so forth until we reach Zenith. And then we can keep going. We can get a Rabbit Perch, Celestial Starboard, Eventide, Night Glow, etc. And we can keep going, and we can keep looping through the sheet, and this will give us every single item we pass. As an analogy, imagine you're in the grocery store, and whenever you pass by an item, a copy magically materializes in your shopping cart. Two copies, actually. And this will keep happening regardless of whether there's space in your shopping cart or not. This is basically what MCGO does. When given fuel, MCGO will spew out every single item you pass by as you transmute. This can be very useful for doing things like obtaining full sets of armor, or if there's many things you want to get. Let's do one final comprehensive example. To help me keep track of where the Basts are, I'm going to place a torch that synchronizes with the Bast state. This torch is currently synced with the Basts being on, so I always know when I'm stepping forwards. It can be a bit difficult to keep track of the Basts when they're invisible, so adding this singular torch can make your transmutations a lot more reliable. Now then, what item do I want to transmute? Well, let's say I want the Rod of Harmony. The first thing you want to do is open up the transmutation spreadsheet and find the Philosopher's Stone sheet. It should look something like this. Next, use Ctrl F to search and find the item you're looking for. Given that we're using a wooden door for all of our transmutations, we need to look at the top row, highlighted in orange. This shows all of the items we can obtain from a wooden door. However, if we want to obtain the Rod of Harmony, we want the item in the next column, in this case a cursed blue brick wall, because rather than stepping forwards, we're wrapping around the sheet going backwards. If you don't know what a given item looks like, all you need to do is click on it and open the wiki page. It's also not a bad idea to look at what the items before and after your target are, so you know if you've overshot. Now that we've figured out our route, let's go back in game. Now that we're in multiplayer, let's perform our transmutations. I'll place down our door, ensuring the Bast is in the on state. Recall that we always hold W and then we hold S when we want to transmute. If the Bast is in the correct state, you should begin cycling through items. In this case, it looks like we overshot, so our door is now nothing. But this is easy to fix. All we need to do to switch directions is jump, and then we can continue transmuting as normal, except we're now subtracting 36 IDs every time. And there's our blue brick wall. Before performing MCGO, make sure the door is closed. Then, place down your fuel. Lastly, all we need to do is find the top right corner of the campfire, and press right click until our desired item pops out. And there we are, a Rod of Harmony, buried amongst a whole lot of other things. So give me a second to inventory manage. The process outlined in this comprehensive example works for any item with an ID greater than 649. If we want an item with an ID below 649, that's when we need to use the Black Hole glitch. Black holes are actually the one item transmutation method that won't be covered in this video because of their complexity and overall weirdness. However, in the meantime, if you want to play with black holes for yourself, all you need to do is place down a door, open it, place down fuel, and a CGO once. You'll notice that the top part of the door will return to the primordial void from whence all came. Using MCGO on a black hole is a slow but sure way to receive all of the items from ID 649 counting down. Black holes do have a few other interesting properties, such as being able to duplicate items very quickly and being able to dig elevators automatically. So, subscribe so you don't miss that. And that's it. You are now transmutation certified. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed putting it together. This was a massive project and I'm glad to have gotten it done before 145 dropped. Even if 1.4.5 breaks transmutation, 
I plan to break 1.4.5. A huge thank you to Mike, UNFTF, and Dominic Karma for providing their technical expertise with looking into Terraria's code. Without them, transmutation would not be where it is today. I'd also like to thank Exacult, Wasefi, and Megaswa for helping with the early days of transmutation research. A special shout out to Gromic999 for helping with those early days as well, and for helping me with this whole YouTube thing. I would have no idea how to make thumbnails without their help. And lastly, be sure to check out Icy Snowman's YouTube channel. They're the one who made the spreadsheet on Philosopher's Stone and were instrumental to helping develop the glitch. And thank you for watching all the way to the end. So have a little bonus from a future project. I hope that you have a good day, and as always, take care.